In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Well, dear saints, I ought to warn you, before this sermon begins, that the very words of Jesus, just following the parable we heard today, take care how you hear. Take care how you hear. After all, preaching the word of God is not like a lecture you may have received in school. It's not some motivational speech. It's not like a campaign speech or something like that. There's something more going on here. There's something deeper, something supernatural, in fact. You may say there's something miraculous going on in the very preaching and in the hearing of the Word. And so, preaching the Word and hearing the Word is nothing less than Entering into spiritual warfare. You're stepping down into the trenches right now. It's happening before your eyes, or rather before your ears. And so we hear the parable of the sower, in which Christ would not have you unaware, dear saints, of all of the enemies who would rather you did not hear the word of God. They're all around you. They're always trying to get at you, always trying to rob you of the blessed hope you have through the very words of Jesus. So you hear the parable of the sower. And as Jesus himself explains it, the seed is the word of God, the word that is preached, which means the sower is the preacher. And if we may say so, the sower is in fact not a preacher, but the preacher. It is himself, Jesus the one who sows the seed, the one who proclaimed first upon this earth the blessed gospel in the flesh, in his own body. The seed is the word. It gets sown, scattered abroad, scattered to ears who will hear it and who will hear it not. And then comes the enemies. First, the birds. Although in the parable, as Jesus tells us, it is the devil. The devil himself comes and snatches the word, snatches the seed away from your ears before you can even take it in, before they can plant any roots in you, before they can sprout any fruit. Indeed, dear saints, maybe the devil sends to you this very morning a fly buzzing in your ear and you don't get to hear, you get distracted from the gospel that's being proclaimed. Or maybe he's spent all morning stirring you up to some bitterness, some anger, and your heart cannot, will not, is not in the right spirit to receive the blessed gospel. He's going to do whatever he can, whether it be a fly or some anger or any other of the devil's thousand arts. And then you'll become, just like James says in his epistle, you'll end up like the man who looks in a mirror, sees his face, and then immediately goes away and forgets what he looks like. For how many hear the word, hear what is proclaimed, and then immediately walk away and forget it ever happened. Forget they heard it at all. Go and live just as they were living before. It's a feature of the parable of the sower, by the way, that Jesus doesn't do anything in it except describe. He doesn't give you a solution. He doesn't give you an answer, not in the parable anyway. And preachers often have this struggle. They're going to take up this parable and give you some program, some solution. Just do this, and then you'll know you'll be the right type of soil. That's not how the parable goes. In the parable, Jesus just lets you know the devil is there trying to snatch it away from your ear. So I'll tell you, not out of my own words, but based on the scriptures themselves, if you have any defense against the devil, then you ought to at the very least take up prayer. That's why we do indeed take up prayer prayer before we even hear the word of God in the service. We prayed today, in fact. What was our prayer today? O God, the strength of all who put their trust in you, grant that by your power we may be defended against all adversity. That doesn't just start when you walk out the doors today. It's already begun. You're in the trenches now, after all. And what comes next? Then the seed sown upon the rocks can't plant any roots it can't lay them down deep and so when the sun comes out when the time of testing comes jesus says they fall away they're scorched and withered and they can bear no fruit and so it happens that the world is also out there trying to scorch you trying to prevent you from putting down roots in fact if you haven't noticed our world today revels in rootlessness 
It loves the fact that there is no depth. It loves the fact that nothing is certain, nothing is true, nothing is objective. The Word of God would have it exactly the opposite way. Only that which is objective and true is that which you should put your roots down into. Sink them deep and thereby have something solid to stand upon when the time of testing comes. Now, maybe Jesus spoke this especially with the very persecution that the martyrs, that his own apostles hearing it, would endure. For all but John, they say, were killed for the faith. And many more besides that, all through ancient history, not just then, but all the way through the history of the church, there are still martyrs in the world today. Still those who are tested and burned by the sun, and yet they have roots. They're not simply rootless, cast upon the rocks. We maybe don't have it quite yet, and yet even here, even in Oklahoma, even in Chickasha, you feel pressure. That's what the Greek word means. Tribulation, we usually translate it, but the word itself means squeezing. Something tight, something pressure upon you. And the world around you always has all sorts of pressures that make it rather uncomfortable, at least, to be a Christian. And you feel the pressure all the time not to speak as a Christian in the world, in the public. Not to live as a Christian. And so, if you don't have roots there's going to be a problem. You're not going to hold up. And then comes the third one, the seed sown among the thorns. And, well, you know right from the get-go, that's not going to go well. The thorns are not maybe what you think they would be. You've already had the devil and the world and its pressures, but now you have pleasure and joys and riches and, indeed, cares and anxieties. Luke says the cares and the riches and the pleasures of this life And what do they do? They choke the word. They choke it right out of you. It seems counterintuitive, at least to us and to our flesh. Our flesh loves the cares and the pleasures of this life and all its riches. We think if we have those things, then finally we'll be happy. Finally we'll be content. Finally we will be secure. And yet time and time again, we find that the more cares and riches and pleasures you have in this life, the less secure you are. In fact, they come to possess you, not unlike the thorns and the weeds come to possess and take hold and choke the plants that try and grow up among them. In the end, Jesus does give at least this prescription, that a seed that is to bear much fruit is to endure all these things with patience in the good soil. And so it takes a certain patience to endure the testing and the pressure and the persecution of the world. It takes patience of another sort to endure the pleasures of life without letting them possess you. And so we have these three enemies, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, which loves those cares and those riches. And these three, the devil, the world, and the flesh, do not want God's name to be hallowed. They do not want his kingdom to come. And yet all the same... Even as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, God lets his gracious will be done. He breaks and hinders every evil plan and purpose of these enemies. And that's why they are so bitter, so angry, so fervent to choke the life out of you and choke the word out of you. They hate nothing else than the word of God so much because by nothing else have they been defeated. This is their enemy. He is the devil to the devil. He is the thorns to the thorns. All the patriarchs and the prophets and the apostles preached this word. And so we hear even from Isaiah, even as the prophet preached to a people hard of neck, difficult of understanding, stubborn. Seek the Lord, he says. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Why, Isaiah? Why do you tell us this? Why should we? Turn and seek the Lord. And the prophet says, Return to the Lord that he may have compassion on you. Return to your God, for he will abundantly pardon. This is what Isaiah is taking up when he speaks of the rain and the snow falling down upon the earth. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven, this is the very mercy and compassion that the Lord has for you in his word as they come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, 
making it bring forth, even conceiving in the earth and bringing forth and sprouting, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word, the Lord says, be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Dear saints, the word never, ever goes forth of the Lord's mouth in vain. For indeed, it was the word that came forth from the Lord in the beginning, before all eternities, the word of God that was begotten before all worlds. And it did not go forth in vain. In fact, the Lord spoke the word in the beginning at creation, and it was by that word, the very living person, the word of God, that he created all things. And how fruitful indeed did he make this earth. It was not in vain that the Lord spoke, let there be light. Indeed, it was not in vain that the Lord spoke, let us make man in our image. And so it was not in vain either when the word became flesh, when the word went out from the Lord's mouth and the word went forth from the heavenly throne and came down into our dusty, thorny and rocky soil and took upon our flesh and became man for us. Indeed, our Lord does not despise to cast his word, even his incarnate word, even upon the rocks and the thorns. And so it was that he wore the thorns, came to a death upon a cross in a rocky place. And even in death, the word did not go forth in vain. He went out from Jerusalem to that cross, knowing that he was going in order to be planted into the earth, to conceive within that tomb life and then to bring forth life out of that tomb once and for all to bear abundant fruit. And so it happens that we read the rest of what Isaiah says in this prophecy. Indeed, the word will not go forth empty or vain. For you shall go out in joy and you shall be led forth in peace even out of the tomb itself. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing. All the trees of the field shall clap their hands. Instead of the thorn shall come up the cypress. Instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle. It shall make a name for the Lord, an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. This is what the word was sent out to do. This is what it has done. This is what it does even now and will do even to the last day. Jesus burst forth from that tomb in a new and greater exodus, leading his people forth not out of the tyranny of Pharaoh of old, but out of the tyranny of death and sin and the devil. And indeed, with the thorns upon his head and rising anew, Christ has undone the curse of the thorns of Adam. And instead of the thorn, indeed, he has brought forth paradise. Maybe not as you look around you, not always at least, but within the very word itself preached to you. So it is, dear saints. The whole story doesn't end there. It doesn't even end with our Lord's resurrection and ascension into heaven. But he is not done showering the earth with his word. For he still comes to you even now. He still comes to water the soil just as Christ the incarnate one came and watered this earth with his blood. He still comes to you with his word and his sacrament to plant in you and conceive in you new life even as he was planted like a seed in the earth. And he works within you to bring forth new life, just as he brought life forth out of the tomb. Seed for the sowing, that's what you're hearing now. Bread for the eating, that's what you're about to receive in a moment. The word of the Lord has provided abundantly through his church that you may hear and believe. That's what St. Paul said in Romans 10 when he tells us that the Lord sent preachers So that they may hear, his people may hear the word, and they hear so that they may believe, and they believe so that they may call upon his name, so that despite all of the devil's rage and all of the choking thorns of this world, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what then, dear saints? Well, this, take up the word of God. For the word came forth from the Father in eternity. The word came forth in the incarnate Son. And the word was sent through the Spirit into the very ears and mouths of the apostles. So that through them we have the word in the scriptures and we have the word in their preaching. And even now that word that came forth from the Father in eternity comes to you and comes to your ears. Why then should this word lie neglected, gathering dust? 
in our Bibles, in our catechisms, in our hymnals, sitting on a shelf somewhere. It's the one thing, this word, that your great enemies actually hate and are afraid of. Take it up. Let us be like Israel should have been of old when the Lord said, Let this word be on your heart. Teach it diligently to your children. Talk of these words when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them on your hands and as frontlets between your eyes and write them on the doorposts of your gates. Let the word always be upon your mind and in your heart. In that way, dear saints, if you find yourselves attacked by the devil, then take up this word for it is indeed the armor and the sword of the spirit. As St. Paul says, take up the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. For even as Jesus sent out his disciples of old, he told them that he saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. If you find yourself perturbed by this world and its pressures, if you find yourself concerned about what you hear on the news, then let your roots go deep into the good soil of the Scriptures. And then you will find yourself like a house built on the rock, untroubled when the storm comes. And if you find your flesh tempted by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, then take up the song of Isaiah, drink deep from the wells of salvation, from the very scriptures themselves. For by our Lord's word, he does not neglect to transform even the barren and the rocky and the thorny soil into a paradise of cypress and myrtle, into a fruitful paradise. And so, dear saints, as our Lord says in the parable, indeed, you will endure through the word in the good soil, bearing fruit even a hundredfold. You will be a branch grafted into the tree of life, and you will be a pillar in the house of your God, never to be cut off forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.